Well, we're studying Psalm 7 today, and the title of the study is an ABCD for responding to insults. A book I found helpful in putting this Bible study together is this one, Comfort and Encouragement, a study in Psalms 1 to 50. And it's actually written by my father-in-law, Graham Trice. Uh, but let's start by reading Psalm 7. It begins by saying, A Shigion of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjaminite. So the psalm begins in verse 1. O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it and let them trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous. You who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. My shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. So, in your Bible, you'll see some words just before verse 1 of Psalm 7. Not the words in bold, which is a title added by the translator just to be helpful, but the words in italics. In the Psalms, these words are in the original Hebrew, but they wouldn't have been sung with the rest of the psalm. They were used either to give instructions to the musicians, or to give some idea of the background to that particular psalm. In the words introducing Psalm 7, we're told that this is a Shigion of David. So David wrote this, and Shigion probably refers either to its tune or to the structure of the lyrics. We're then told he sang this to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjaminite. David was caused problems by people from the tribe of Benjamin on several occasions, most notably when King Saul was trying to kill him. Here, though, David is responding to things that a person called Cush was saying about David, words that were insulting and, as far as David was concerned, incorrect and unfair. And this was really upsetting David. He writes in verse 2, Lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces, with none to deliver me. David felt like he was being hunted down and was about to be pounced upon. It's interesting that David uses that kind of image. What might we use today? If you've experienced this kind of malicious attack on social media or during online gaming, you might have referred to someone as a troll. 
Well, that's what David is describing. He was being trolled and it felt unrelenting and like he was being torn apart. David turns to the Lord for help. He cries out to God in prayer, describing what is happening, how it makes him feel, and asking to be rescued. O oh Lord my God, he writes, in you do I take refuge. Save me. Deliver me. So here is the initial letter of our ABCD for responding to insults. Ask God for help, first of all. This is beneficial in two ways. Firstly, God is able to help. When we pray and ask God for help, we're approaching someone who has greater power than any other. We have a great enemy, the devil, who wants to keep us chained to our sin and guilt before God and who wants us to always feel accused. But God has provided a rescuer, Jesus Christ, who defeated that enemy upon the cross and rescued us from our sins. So although you may feel weaker than the one causing you grief, remember that God's strength is greater than any other and is a perfect match for your weakness and ask for his help. As the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Secondly, prayer helps us to pause rather than make a knee-jerk reaction. Reacting straight away is sometimes the worst thing we can do because we end up saying or writing something that we later regret. When we stop to pray, we allow the Holy Spirit an opportunity to prompt us, to remind us of the character of our Saviour when he was being mocked and mistreated. Our aim should be to demonstrate the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our response. So let's remind ourselves of, our, of that list that we find in Galatians chapter 5. Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. These aren't always apparent in that knee-jerk reaction when we're insulted. So it's good to pause and to pray. Here is a personal God. He is my God, David writes, and a powerful God. He is the Lord. David acknowledges the authority God has over his life. Yet God is not a distant monarch but one who is in a covenant relationship with his people, a relationship based on promises. We find this commitment stated, for example, in the book of Exodus, chapter 6, verse 7, where the Lord gives this message to the Israelites, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. This commitment is made by the Lord repeatedly in the Old Testament. He is a powerful yet personal God. So, if God is both powerful and personal, sin is serious for two reasons. Firstly, you're disobeying the highest authority that there is in existence. Whether or not sin involves or affects other people, we can be sure it is an act of rebellion against God. And without a rescuer, we would face God's judgment. David acknowledges this in Psalm 51, verse 4, when he says to the Lord, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. But sin doesn't just displease a powerful God, it grieves a personal God. That's why in the Old Testament, when the Israelites start following false gods and worshipping idols, we find it sometimes referred to as a type of adultery because they were betraying the God that they had vowed to be faithful to. 
their law-breaking was heartbreaking to the Lord. So even though David feels unfairly treated by Cush, he pauses in verses 3 to 5 to take his own sins seriously, to consider the possibility that he may have offended or mistreated Cush without realising it. There is the second letter in our ABCD. Be prepared to examine your own life. We may feel treated unfairly, but it's right for us to also consider our own behaviour. Have I done something that wasn't right? Do I need to apologise for something? Even though the other person is doing something wrong, we're not to think that that negates any wrongdoing on our part. We still need to consider our own sins and, if necessary, repent and apologise. David is confident that God is able to help and will ultimately bring about a fair and just conclusion. First, he asks for God to act clearly in this situation. Arise, he says, lift yourself up, awake for me, return on high. He wants God to demonstrate that he is above everyone else and that he has authority over all involved. David has confidence in God's judgment and believes that those who have unjustly caused grief to God's people will face justice. Verse 6, you have appointed a judgment. Verse 8, the Lord judges the people. And verse 11, God is a righteous judge. David isn't afraid to face that judgment. The Lord refers to him in the first book of Samuel as a man after my own heart. Not sinless, but sincere. And David trusts that in following the Lord sincerely, he can be judged according to his righteousness and his integrity. So he prays in verse 9, O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous. Thus in verse 10, he describes this righteous judgment as a shield. He knows that whatever people may say about him, there is a greater and more authoritative judgment that he will face. And it is that verdict that will stick. His confidence that God will keep his promises to those who are faithful to him comforts him like a shield when others try to make him feel like a failure. So there is our letter C. Comfort yourself with the knowledge that God is just. We've recognised recently in the Gospel of Matthew that there will be a day of judgement when the world will be divided into two groups. One group will enter into eternal life and the other will enter into eternal punishment. David describes God poetically in verses 12 and 13, as being like a person preparing to ambush someone. If a man does not repent, David writes, then he will face God's judgment, like burning arrows raining down from above, unavoidable and deadly. In verses 14 to 16, David makes it clear that the individual is responsible for their sins. They conceive it, they carry it, and they therefore experience the consequences. In a sense, people set themselves up for judgment, like someone falling into a pit that they themselves dug. As an illustration, I remember several years ago, we were visiting someone who lived out in the sticks and they had a small rifle, which they allowed Luke to try out under their supervision. It had a scope on it. So Luke had his face pressed up to the scope as he pulled the trigger. Of course, he wasn't prepared for the recoil, and as he fired the gun, it pushed backwards and smacked him in the eye. He wasn't hurt badly, but it was an example of what David describes in verse 16. On his own skull, his violence descends. Sin inevitably leads to judgment. 
it inevitably invites the wrath of a powerful God upon ourselves. But thankfully, this powerful God is also a personal God who wants us to know him as our father more than as our judge. And he has provided someone who can rescue us from that judgment. We read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that God isn't being slow at bringing about that promised day of judgment, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So we have a God who is just and fair, who must therefore punish all sin, but who is also loving and patient, and who has planned a perfect rescue, one that allows him, as we read in Romans chapter 3, verse 26, to be just and the justifier, that allows him to punish sin, but declare sinners to be innocent. How does that happen? How can this barrier of guilt be removed so that we can be reconciled to God? We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When Jesus died on the cross, he carried the sins of his people. He bore their guilt and was condemned in their place. His sinless life allowed him to die for the sins of others. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. The cross, therefore, satisfies the judgment of God regarding the sins of his people. But something else takes place too. Jesus dies so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. By trusting Jesus as our rescuer, by putting our faith in him, we take shelter in his perfect life, a life that satisfied God's standards of perfect holiness, a life that God looks at and declares the verdict innocent. Hence, because of this exchange that takes place, God can be described as just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In verse 17, David commits to giving thanks to God and praising him. Firstly, this reveals that David is anticipating an answer to his prayers that will therefore lead to thanksgiving and praise. But secondly, it expresses something else that is important to remember, that God is good. And even when we're facing difficult times, there will always be reasons for thanksgiving and praise thanking him for what we receive and praising him for what we observe. We can thank him each day for the spiritual blessings we have received in Christ, such as our assurance of eternal life, the promised presence of the Holy Spirit and the comfort of his steadfast love. We can thank him for the daily blessings we experience as he provides for our needs. We can thank him for the privilege of being a child in his family, for the fellowship we enjoy within the church, and for the assurance we have of, our, of one another's prayers. As we give thanks for what we receive, we also are to praise God for what we observe, for his generosity and kindness demonstrated in the gospel, for his faithfulness and steadfast love towards his people, for his love for the lost, for his wisdom and understanding. We praise God when we proclaim his undiminishing glory and greatness. Even though David was upset by what was being said about him, he lifted himself off the floor and up to the heavens. He turned his heart towards the Lord and found not only a shield, but also a song. And there we find our fourth letter, D. Don't stop praising the Lord.
Well, I can think of a couple of occasions where I felt I was being made out to be the bad guy and I didn't think that was fair. Both situations were quite a few years ago, so I don't remember every detail, but I do recall a couple of things that are relevant to what we thought about this evening. Firstly, I trusted God's plan for church life to be a good plan. So I made sure that we as a family continued to have fellowship in a gospel-centered church. In that sense, we didn't stop praising the Lord. Even if this kind of problem occurs in a church, you shouldn't allow yourselves to drift, but should seek, if necessary, to be in regular fellowship with another church and accountable to elders in that church. Secondly, a few years later after one of the events, I remember examining my own life and reflecting on how I could have behaved differently. It's not helpful to dwell on actions that you now regret, but it is helpful to think through how you would hope to behave differently with the same kind of situation to arise again. That's the purpose of the final question of this study. What lesson have you learned from this psalm that you could apply in the future? So in summary, we found an A, B, C, D response to insults. Ask God for help, first of all. Be prepared to examine your own life. Comfort yourself with the knowledge that God is just. And don't stop praising the Lord.